Okay, so our first question is, how and when did you first become a human rights educator? Yeah, so um, I, I've had an interesting um, pathway to becoming a human rights educator. So I've always, since I was really, really little, wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I uh, eventually went to uh, the Yukon School of Education, uh, went through the social studies ed program uh, there. And it was interesting because my social studies ed program was really gauged uh, with a human rights lens. Um, primarily, we were focusing on World War II and Holocaust education. Um, and so um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know that kind of going into the program, but that was kind of the, the uh, narrow focus. Um, and so I had a lot of opportunities, even in my uh, pre-service education, um, whether it's um, really looking intimately at how do we teach the Holocaust uh, effectively in uh, K to 12 classrooms? Um, how do we build historical empathy? Um, I did a lot of uh, museum work. I actually took a, uh, as part of the program, a two week uh, trip with a number of other teachers to Europe uh, to study World War II and Holocaust sites. So it was really, really immersive. Um, and so I got a kind of a foundation in my um, undergrad and then graduate year. So I went on right to my graduate. Um, in terms of pivoting directly into human rights ed, it was interesting. So end of my graduate year, had an opportunity at UConn um, that kind of came across the wires to join a team at the Dodd Center for Human Rights um, that would be partnering with the Edward M. Kennedy Center um, up in Boston. Um, the center was just coming on board. It's a Senate uh, simulation and government center. And I had the opportunity to join a team that would design a interactive Senate simulation on children's rights. And so the whole uh, goal behind it would be students going to the center, um, engaging as like mock senators and actually passing legislation around children's rights. Um, really interesting work, uh, very nuanced, a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Um, but, you know, we have, we, we as a country are the only country on the face of the earth that has not um, signed on to the Children's Rights Convention. So I thought it was a really, really interesting, powerful um, kind of entry point into human rights work. Um, from there, I was able to, um, you know, I think that work really kind of drew me into this uh, type of work. Um, and I was able to do a number of other things, uh, partnering with the Dodd Center as I kind of started my first job. Um, and really, again, I think that the Dodd Center, some of the staff there, um, particularly Dr. Glenn Matoma, was very, very instrumental in helping to um, help my own high school where I was working, Manchester High School, um, kick off and start its own human rights class. Um, and so we were really, really uh, excited to kind of create that partnership and, you know, kind of build human rights ed as a major experience at Manchester High School from from there on out. So um, kind of an interesting pathway, um, not really the traditional route of, um, you know, I'm going to get into this in my undergrad and, and be directly involved in, in human rights. But um, I found that a lot of those experiences have kind of led me to where I am today, um, you know, many, many years later. Um, I love that um, Senate simulation at the center that you're speaking about. Do you, do they still do that? Or is that expanded to other locations? I'm just curious. They still do it at the EMK Center. Um, I believe, if I'm correct, they have a number of other topics and uh, focuses for other simulations. But um, they have students going there all the time. I think they just kicked it back into in-person uh, after, you know, the pandemic. So it's been really powerful to kind of see like some of that work um, take a hold. Yes. And is it um, high school students who are participating? Yeah, I think so. I believe the whole simulations are geared towards, I think there's a six to eight one and there's a nine to 12 um, band and there's different offerings in terms of big building field trips there. Yeah, that's great. I'm just thinking too, maybe some students who have participated in that would be interested in the award too, or their oh, yeah. members. I'm just, yeah. yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, and our next question is, please describe your human rights education and training work, um, which you've given us a great background to. Yeah, so um, there, there's, I think there's a lot here. Um, you know, as I was speaking before about 
jumping into this early on in my my career, um, I I really think that for me, this matters very deeply. And I, I've kind of enshrined it into um, a lot of what I've done. So, um, you know, from the get-go, even starting at Manchester High School many years ago, um, I was offered the opportunity to create a new class. Um, and it was originally touted as a life skills class. It was going to be a new graduation requirement. And it by a, a series of happenstances, I was able to work with a team to actually change that to create, make it a human rights class. Um, and so in a very, very short period of time in uh, 2014, 2015, we were able to take an original, um, com almost completely different intent intended class and change that into a human rights class that is a graduation requirement for all students uh, matur matriculating out of uh, Manchester High School. Um, it's unique in Connecticut. It's where the only uh, high school in Connecticut that does that. And from my understanding, we're the only uh, high school in the country that does that. And so... Um, I take that as a moment of pride. It was a lot of work to kind of put together. Um, and so that is kind of where I've always centered my work. Um, from there, you know, with partnerships with UConn and the Dodd Center, um, with a, a number of other partners that I've gotten involved with, um, I've been able to really kind of grow my own human rights ed capacity, but also help serve others. So um, there's a number of teachers in the state of Connecticut who are certified human rights teachers. They teach um, early college experience human rights classes through the University of Connecticut. Um, I was part of the original cohort of three, and we've arisen that to about 35 teachers across the state of Connecticut. Um, and I, some of those teachers I've kind of worked shoulder to shoulder with. I've helped them kind of um, think about their curriculum, think about how do we address um, even district concerns of how do you bring in a human rights class and other barriers that are out there. Um, so on a local level, that's really been very powerful work. Um, more recently, um, some of the work that I've been doing is trying to infuse um, specifically civics uh, education language and human rights ed language into our new um, Connecticut social studies standards. I was part of a project last year where we're kind of revising and updating and creating new standards for the state of Connecticut for social studies. Um, and so there's right now intentional language um, in some of the civic standards and U.S. history standards around human rights, which I'm very, very proud of. I'm, I'm excited to kind of see those um, move forward. Um, and then, you know, beyond, I, I really think a lot of the other human rights ed work that I've done has been based on opportunities and partnerships that I, I've, I've kind of, come across. So um, meeting people like Christy Rodillas Palmer, meeting people like Sandra Sirota, um, meeting people like Monisha Bajaj, um, you know, these folks who are standard bearers in the field, um, a lot of these folks have really, you know, in conversations and dialogue in Zoom meetings, have just said, like, here's an opportunity what do you think about this? And do you want to take it on? And I think that's been really informative to my own just growth as a person. But also, um, I I think I've seized on that. I think I, I've tried to say, where can I be of service? Um, so whether it's doing some curriculum work, uh, thinking about uh, training for HRUSA, whether it's um, serving as the co-chair for the human rights ed community at National Council for Social Studies, um, you know, whatever it might be, I have seen it as where can I be of service and where can I take some of my experience and expertise and really try to fuse that in into areas that need it um, and areas that quite, quite honestly, don't always get the attention or need a little bit of a push to move towards a more human rights friendly um, atmosphere. So um, a lot of that is just really, really powerful work. And and I've appreciated being able to work with people who have said like, hey, Jake, you know, we think you could serve in this way, or we think you could, you know, could you help us with this opportunity? Um, or, or do you want to take this on? And that's been really, really meaningful for me. Um, the last thing I'll just say, I know I'm, I'm speaking on and on here, but I really beyond myself, I really believe in um, 
youth powered work around human rights ed. I really think that um, young people have a huge role to play when it comes to advancing education, human rights, social justice um, locally and, and here in the country. So a lot of my a lot of my mental power is focused on that as well. Yes, thank you, Jake. And the the class that you have started with high school students, I love that you've blazed that trail. Um, and I'm sure some of them have gone on to want to study um, human rights at the higher education level. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know Rick Halperin? Um, he's at Southern Methodist University. Um, I've been on a couple meetings with him, yeah. Okay. Yes, we we're just speaking with him, and he said there's only, I believe, nine colleges in the U.S. that have a human rights program. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and when you're saying that, you believe that's the only class that's um, K through 12 in the country. Um, that's amazing, and certainly needs to be expanded. <laughs> it's and it's. I'll just say one other thing. I think like that mm -hmm. the the expansion of it. Um, you know, districts have to think about, do they want this? And what are the values of the district? And what are the barriers and challenges? Um, but I, I have seen it work and I've seen it be successful. Um, and I've seen it grow for students who, quite honestly, might not otherwise take a human rights class in K-12 to or in higher ed. And so I think some of the mechanisms we put together have been really, really effective. And I'm 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 proud to say that we we continue to offer it now, you know, seven, eight years later, so. Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so this year we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So what human rights accomplishments are you most proud of and what recommended action would you like to see happen? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm most proud of, um, I think, despite what's happening in the news, um, I try to parse through that a little bit. And I think that um, as much as we have a lot of challenges and we are very much a, a turning into, if not already, a patchwork nation um, with a lot of different locales with different priorities, um, you know, passing uh, things like universal health care, which again, have come under under huge challenges, but have stand the test of time. Um, that has been massive. That has been a massive uplift for millions of people who needed a very, very basic right to health. Um, whether we're talking about passing bills around gender equity, um, gun legislation. I mean, we have we have a crisis uh, of enormous magnitude, and whether it's the national government or even local government um, passing legislation to really say we want safe communities, but we also want people to feel like they can live a dignified life. Um, I think that has been a human rights win. I'll just say for Connecticut, you know, I, we had a, the, you know, Sandy Hook shooting, we had a massive, massive um, event that took place in 2012. And immediately, Connecticut acted and, and took a step forward and said, we're gonna do something about this. And to be frank, I think we are a much more human rights friendly state now because of actions like that. And the trickle down effect has been has been really huge. Um, so I, I think like that type of work is really important. I think some of the other accomplishments um, in, in especially in recent years is we've seen a lot of younger people, um, whether it's high school students, whether it's college age students, whether it's, you know, upwards of 30 year olds um, saying we want better for our communities and we are going to do something about it. Um, and, you know, it's not always in, in mass protests, but it's, it's with advocacy, it's with people speaking out, it's with people calling attention to, um, structures of power. Um, you know, I think that has been really something we could see as a human rights win. Um, I mean, right now, right, literally right now, as we're talking, we have folks who are, you know, thousands of people who are striking, um, against the motion picture industry because of um, very, very basic things about, around workers' rights. And I think that is something we can kind of take stock in as these are human rights accomplishments we're moving forward. Um, to the second part of your question, I think where we need to go and some other recommendations, um, I would love, um, maybe it's a pipe dream, I don't know, I would love to see the United States sign on to the Children's Rights Convention. Um, I think it's huge. I think we need to um, even 
even from a symbolic stance, I think we need to really clearly articulate that our kids have basic rights. Um, I also think we need to do a lot more, and this probably won't come from the national government, but I think from local groups, organizations, um, you know, di districts, school districts, um, we need to take, I think, a bigger stance around um, what do we value in terms of being taught in our classrooms? And how do we not allow for, quite frankly, extremist views, um, agenda-seeking views to corrupt education? Um, our kids deserve to go to school, feel safe, feel accepted, feel included. Um, and we are going down a path that is uh, scary. I think we, we have to take stock in the good work that is happening in school districts. Um, we have to take stock in the good work that's being passed um, to protect kids. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I'm always trying to check myself on, on not being too defeatist about that and, and too jaded and too negative. But, um, you know, those other folks are kind of winning the day right now. And, and we need more people to say, absolutely not. This is what we're going to teach in the classrooms. This is important. And this is why it matters for kids and you know, kids and their long-term growth as, as citizens. So um, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I think we need to do more as a community to um, support those efforts. I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up um, the writer strike because, you know, initially that's not something that I would connect to being a human rights issue, um, but you're absolutely right. And I'm thinking too, the um, the don't say gay bill that was introduced in Florida. Um, we just had a very similar one introduced here in Ohio um, in the book bans, of course. And so it's an especially difficult time for you um, to be a K through 12 teacher. And I really admire all the, the work that you're doing and remaining um, optimistic about it. Um, so our next question is more geared toward HRE USA. Um, how has your connection to them made a difference to you? Yeah, um, I think HRE USA has been a really um, impactful community and family to be a part of. Um, I, I've been a member for a while. Um, I joined a couple years ago. I I joined on as the Connecticut Connecticut Regional Representative, um, and I think beyond just being a a voice from the local level to a national organization and having kind of that me being a conduit as a and a, and a pipeline between some local folks and the, and the national organization. Um, I think for me personally, just being able to um, get my hands in on some of this really imp impactful work, right? So I'm really thrilled and honored to be part of the Edmonds Fellow uh, Committee where we've helped uh, fellows like you, right? Who are coming on and, and doing some meaningful work to kind of be part of that process and to say, here is where I can serve and here's where I can um, help amplify some of these really meaningful goals that we might have never thought of five, 10 years ago um, has been really, really impactful. Um, I also think just meeting folks. Um, so a couple of years back, I attended a um, conference put on by the Human Rights Ed Program at University of San Francisco. And I met a ton of great people there. I also um, met not only some participants that I, I still very much stay in contact with, but um, I met faculty members and I met other folks who are connected with other th folks through human rights uh, uh, education, human rights education, edu educators USA. So I think the tentacles and the networking and the the partnerships um, and the value we see in each other as colleagues and family members um, has been really, really impactful and really meaningful. And some of these folks that um, I've been connected with have really helped me to see my own potential, um, see my own strength. Um, and I'm, I hope that the conversations and the work I've done with them has has been mutual. mutual. Um, and yeah, I think it's just a really powerful network. I think we, as a network, we have still room to grow. I think we have um, you know, goals that we can continue to kind of amplify. Um, but it's been a really, really uh, powerful familia to be a part of. Yes, thank you. And I've only been a part of HRE USA for 
um, a month and a half or less. Um, and I already know that this is something that I want to be a part of for a long time. Um, and like you said, it the the members give me a sense of confidence too. Um, and hope, um, knowing everything that they've accomplished um, and all that there's left to do. Um, it's a really amazing organization. I agree. Um, and this year we're launching the Youth in Action for Human Rights Awards. And our inaugural theme is promoting democracy, protecting human rights. Um, and what does that theme mean to you? Yeah, the theme of, um, you know, protect, uh, Promoting democracy and protecting human rights. Um, oh, it, <laughs> I think it it hits home more than ever now. Um, if we look at what's happening internationally, if we happen see what's happening uh, locally, um, you know, in the United States, we are seeing a very clear erosion of very basic democracy that we've had for you know, two two hundred forty five years. And I think to me what that enshrines is not necessarily about legislation or it's not necessarily about big things that are going to get done, but um, small close to home work that is really important for citizens to pay attention to and to get involved with. Um, I think quite honestly, a lot of Americans um, for a, a multitude of reasons don't always um, tune in. And maybe feel like, you know what, whatever's going on, I just got to handle my own daily life, which I I understand, right? Like bread and butter issues are part of the American lexicon. Um, I think we have an obligation as citizens to do more to get after the active part of that theme, the promoting and protecting. Um, and I think that there are threats out there, but I am more concerned about people turning a blind eye or muting themselves or feeling like there's a there's no hope and there's no and, and almost like a sense of apathy. I think that is more dangerous um, and really kind of underpins that theme that you're talking about. So for me, I would love to see where can we hone the work, the efforts the motivation of people close to home, people who are willing to stand up um, and people who are willing to say this matters for our survival. And when I say our, I mean every single person's survival. Um, I don't think it's always going to come with a, a big piece of legislation. I don't think it's going to come with a speech. Um, I think it's going to really take people who are on the grassroots level to do that. And and primarily, as I said before, young people. I think we have an obligation to do more to say, this matters for you. Um, even if you don't think it does, even if you can't see it right in front of you, um, this matters more than you 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 know, and we need you in partnership to um, protect and, and promote. Yes, I absolutely agree with you with the grassroots action, and I'm really excited to see some of the submissions that we get this year um, to see what sort of work the students are doing. And I think just going through um, all of those submissions will give us a renewed sense of hope too, knowing all that is going out there that um, we might not be aware of on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. um, and so our final question is, are there any other human rights oriented organizations that you work with or you know of um, that you'd recommend for us to connect with um, to help market the Youth in Action Awards? Yeah, there's one. Um, I am part of the Human Rights Close to Home initiative um, out of the uh, out of UConn and out of the Dodd Center for Human Rights. Um, it's a three year project um, to basically advance civic education and human rights education both with Connecticut teachers and with young people. So um, actually next week, uh, we're starting a two-week institute at the university. Um, young people and adults kind of in partnership with one another, going through sessions, doing workshops, developing civic action plans and curriculum. It's a really, really powerful um, group. Um, tied to the project, I also work um, and 
help guide the Human Rights Close to Home Youth Advisory Team. And that team has been primarily uh, in charge of uh, developing a one-day youth summit um, for Connecticut high school students. So they put together, um, you know, the what the conference will look like, uh, put together sessions, invited speakers, um, designed the entire day. It's completely youth driven. Um, we've done other youth summits in the past, but the last in 2022 and 2023, we've run um, this particular Human Rights Close to Home Summit for Connecticut high school students. Um, and there are members of that team. Um, there are, I think, prospective members um, down the road that I think would be very, very um, in line for the Youth in Action um, uh, Award. I think I'm really empowered um, as the staff advisor to see the work that young people can do and and grapple through those challenges, um, use adults in the way that we, we need to. But um, for me and my co-advisor, Chris Buckley, we kind of allow them to thrive. We take it, we say, hey, think about this, think about this, but we step back and we allow them to thrive. So um, I think that organization, that group in itself um, might be one to kind of pay attention to and focus in on um, for potentially this year or future years um, for the, the the award. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. I, I love the idea of the youth summits. Um, I feel like I've been saying this over and over, but that's something that I'd like to see pop up um, in other areas too. Um, it would be great to honestly, um, you know, we've done it. We've done it in various formats in Connecticut since about either 16 or 17. Um, I would love to see the next phase of that um, either beyond human rights close to home, beyond UConn, but others kind of taking on the model and being able to kind of replicate that in other spaces. And even, even if you don't have, you know, the, a university and you don't have the space and you don't have like the, the, the stuff behind you, having the model and being able to say, okay, what can we work with? And who, you know, are there community organizations we can partner with? Are there other backers that can help support um, something similar, even if it's not, you know, um, a large scale type of thing. I would love to your point. I would love to see kind of that replication as we move forward. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, those are all the questions that I had for you. Um, but I did want to open it up in case um there's any other um stories that you have of HRE USA or any final words of wisdom that you wanted to leave us with. Um, I I would just say I I think HRE USA has made and continues to make a tremendous impact um, locally and across the country. And I really, um, really am excited to kind of see its future in the next two years, five years, 10 years down the road. I hope to be continue to be a partner in that. Um, and I, I can't wait to kind of continue to work on some of the goals, get my hands dirty and, and really continue to serve. So it's been a pleasure to be part of the organization. Um, and I can't tell it enough. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 